Hello and shalom, everybody. My name is Julia Jassy, and you are listening to Nice Jewish Girls, brought to you by Unpacked, a division of Open Door Media. On today's episode, we are talking with Laura Adkins, opinion editor at The Forward. It is an honor to have Laura on our show today. Sharing Laura's story feels so powerful because Laura is the person who shares all of our stories. If you ever submitted or read an op-ed from the forward, Laura is the one who brought that piece to you. She's the keeper of these stories, the sharer of these stories. And I think there's so much excitement in that, so much power in the words she gets the privilege of sharing. In our conversation today, I want to ask, well, what makes a story worth sharing? How does one build a voice, build a narrative? And how does she ensure that all voices are represented equally? I am so excited for you guys to meet her. Let's do this thing. Laura E. Adkins is an award-winning writer, editor, and speaker based in New York. She is the opinion editor of The Forward and an adjunct professor of journalism at Yeshiva University's Stern College for Women. She was previously the opinion editor of the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, the editor of Jewish Insider, and assistant blogs editor at The Times of Israel. Laura's writing has appeared in the Los Angeles Review of Books, The Washington Post, Glamour, and elsewhere. She is frequently requested as a speaker and leads hands-on writing workshops for a variety of organizations and nonprofit groups. Laura, it's such an honor to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. It's so nice to be here. Amazing. So to start from the very beginning, can you tell us a bit about your background as a Jewish woman, where you're from, what role religion played in your life, all the good stuff? I grew up in Springfield, Missouri, which Mm -hmm. is a very interesting place because it's the third largest city in Missouri, but it's kind of like a suburb. And then as soon as you leave, there's nothing but cornfields and cows for four Mm -hmm. hours in every direction. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was a fun place to grow up. But um, coming to New York City at 17, which I did to go to NYU, was like the most exciting thing ever. So um, I, I really first got plugged into like Jewish communal life in college. Um, I, I kind of was like a a person at a buffet for the first time. Like Mm -hmm. I got involved in everything. Um, Mm -hmm. I was very involved in speech and debate in high school and in college, I shifted my focus to the pro Israel organization. Mm -hmm. Um, I was very involved with Hillel and basically just joined like every Jewish centric, um, group that I could on campus. And I think that was really important for me because um, NYU, where I attended, has, you know, tens of thousands of undergraduate students. And it's really hard to find a community in New York City in general. Um, So, you know, before college, religion really wasn't a center point of my life at all. Mm -hmm. And I still don't really think of Judaism as a religion, you know, even though I'm Orthodox, as as much Mm -hmm. as I do, like this, this symbiotic community, really, of, you know, ideas of culture of languages. Um, So I, you know, I have been accused of being a cynical person, which I don't think (laughs) is true. But, um, you know, religion wasn't really, like a focus of my upbringing, um, yeah. but much more like this this method of inquiry and method of connecting to people. Um, mm-hmm. My parents are both very academic. They both have, you know, doctoral degrees, and mm-hmm. they they always really encouraged my younger brother and I to really think about things deeply. Yeah. And I I feel like that really at its core is is what Judaism is about, whether you're religious yeah. or secular, is about like very deeply engaging with things and with each other. Absolutely. Did you grow up Orthodox or did you become more religious later on in life? No, yeah, not at all. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> so it's it's interesting. Yeah, I, I kind of slowly then all at once became Orthodox is how I yeah. put it. Um, I actually had a student in all of my classes freshman year who was an Orthodox Jew, and I'd never... When you were a student or when you were teaching? When I was a student, yeah. Yeah, yeah. um, At NYU, my first semester. And I'd never really encountered Orthodoxy at all um, where I grew up. 
and you know the Chagim were were <laughs> coinciding with the first week of classes as they often do. And this other student was just like out for all the classes and wasn't using their phone. I'm like, what is going on? So I start, mm -hmm. um, you know, poking around, doing research. It's like, wow, there's this thing, orthodoxy, that exists. And um, I, it's funny, like as soon as I found out about Shabbat, I very quickly was like, wow, that's so cool. And yeah. I... Um, you know, I started doing it to the best of my ability and it's at NYU, the Orthodox community was also just, you know, super warm and welcoming and it really just felt like a natural home. And yeah. it also happened to be like the Beit Midrash at NYU was just like <laughs> always populated <laughs> yeah. with people. And I think most of them happen to be Orthodox just because that's yeah. the nature of NYU's community. But, yeah. um, you know, especially in this last year and a half, I, I used to see myself as primarily an Orthodox Jew, at least, you know, once I got plugged in at NYU. And now I really think that these distinctions matter much less than mm -hmm. we make them matter in our heads. Um, like, I, I see myself as Jewish, full stop. Let me put it this way. I think there's a lot of divisions that emerged in the American Jewish community yeah. um, along different fault lines in the past several mm -hmm. years, whether that's political or religious. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think that those distinctions are very unhelpful because you assume so much about people based on which subset of our teeny tiny community they fall yeah. into. Yeah. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. I could also say <laughs> different things if it doesn't. No, it really does. And I, I'm really interested to hear your experience seems like it has super wide array. So you grew up relatively secular in Missouri, um, you know, 15 minutes away from what you described as like a cornfield area. Um, and then you became an Orthodox Jew living in New York City. So now you're working in New York City, you're an accomplished journalist and editor at The Forward. Um, did you see that path being something that you would take when you were in college? It's, it's so funny, not at all. You know, there's a <laughs> Yiddish expression that I love, yeah. even though I don't speak Yiddish, that's man plans and God laughs. And uh -huh, that I love has, that, yeah. Yeah, that has definitely been the story of my life. Um, you know, I, I went to NYU at 17, like fully confident I knew everything that I was going to do for the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I wanted to be a patent attorney for some reason. Well, um, for a 17-year-old, I'm yeah, impressed. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I loved chemistry um, and I loved... Um, policy and things yeah. like that. I was very involved in speech and debate. So I went in at 17, double major in chemistry and economics. Wow. <laughs> and, wow. Yeah, you went all I, in. <laughs> I went all in. Um, <laughs> very quickly found out that the um, chemistry lab life was not for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I studied economics and I love, I love understanding how things fit together and how yeah. different people and systems work together. So I, I was interning in Israel, actually, after, I believe it was after my sophomore year of college, because it was 2014. And I was doing a business student program that connects students with startups in Israel. Mm -hmm. And I was working for a teeny tiny psychographic marketing company, which for those who aren't familiar with what that I'm is. I'm unfamiliar it's, myself. So it's, it's, with it's basically what Facebook got in trouble for doing. It like makes profiles <laughs> of users based on your behavior down to, you know, your personality. Like, are you someone wow. that does more research? Are you an impulsive shopper? Like, do you click very quickly? Um, I feel it called was, out. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was like fascinating that this whole field existed, but um, as things often are in Israel, it was, uh, it was a disorganized startup and, mm -hmm. you know, my Hebrew was not, was not great. And I just felt like very out to sea <laughs> and yeah. um, very not sure of what I was doing at this startup. So about yeah. two weeks into the internship program, um, our, our cohort had an event with different Israeli speakers. And one of the speakers was Miriam Hirschlag, the blogs editor at the Times of Israel. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, there's so many little coincidences in life. Um, it mm -hmm. happens to be that her sister's name is Laura also. <laughs> and I had asked a question during the panel. I don't remember what the question was at all, but um, 
you know, afterwards I went up to her because I wanted to speak a little bit more. And she was like, you should really speak up more when you ask questions. You need to be more assertive. Like, I'll never forget that. She was just very tactless, straightforward about it. Um, so we got to talking and um, a few days la later, I was thinking about that conversation, you know, sitting there at my, my startup -y internship, dissatisfied with nothing to do. And I just sent her a, an email like, hey, I, you know, I really enjoyed meeting you. I actually would be really interested in working with you <laughs> this summer, if yeah. that's an option. You know, I have a housing stipend. Um, you really so, spoke up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, you know, you don't you don't need to pay me. And I imagine you probably can't. But um, like, yeah, I would I would love to work with you. And she was like, OK, <laughs> cool. <laughs> so I I went to the Times of Israel offices, which at the time were in this um, like old house in Jerusalem, like the upstairs of a house. I think there were actually people living downstairs. And oh my gosh. It was also, you know, a very startup y feel, but very it was startup warm. Yeah. And this was 2014. So unfortunately, it was um, Israel's war with Gaza, yeah. um, with Hamas in Gaza. And I remember just being so moved by, and this is something that I really carry with me in my work today as a Jew Jewish journalist. Um, most of the people on staff either had children who were serving in the IDF and, you know, being deployed to Gaza or, you know, had close friends whose children were or, you know, friends in the security apparatus. And it's very difficult to cover stories when you're so close to them. But it's mm -hmm. also so important to be able to tell stories that you're close to. Yeah. And, you know, Israel is... It's not like reporting in the U.S. Um, freedoms of press are are very different. Of course, not comparable to any other country in the Middle East, but mm -hmm. um, the Israeli military and government tell you often that you can't report um, certain pieces of information. And when the three boys were kidnapped, um, it became apparent very early on, this was in 2014, um, that Hamas had had killed the three boys and mm -hmm. it was circulating on WhatsApp. And, you know, as Israeli journalists, um, we, we couldn't report um, that it was known that, that they were dead. And, you know, it just, it just made so much clearer to me, like the delicate balance that we have. Um, I mean, I think particularly as, as a New York Jew on the Upper East Side, like I'm, I'm very comfortable. I won't pretend that I'm not. Yeah. And, our, our freedom is always so tenuous. And I think particularly as journalists, it's so important not to lose sight of that when we're telling stories. And we need to have an appreciation for how important it is to get it right. I think it's really interesting that you bring up the closeness to stories as something to be cautious of, but also something that's very valuable because of the insight and emotion that comes with it is an important thing to, is an important thing to hear. Now you are an op-ed editor, which is really kind of connected to that. You get to tell stories from that first person point of view. You get to be your own voice. Mm -hmm. What is the value that you found in an opinion piece? Yeah, I, you know, I just think it's so powerful when I think of every, whether it's a piece of art or a movie or an article that I've read, what is always the most moving is the personal and the intimate connection that you can have reading something where it's clear that the reporter or the writer like really spent the time treating the subject as a human being. And that, I think, when done right, can really come through in opinion writing. Um, you know, I, I often tell when I teach op-ed writing subjects, it's we forget that our personal experience is a form of expertise, certainly mm -hmm. not a replacement for data or research yeah. or, you know, studies. But, you know, the West has really become divorced from things that aren't highly technical and mathematical. But, yeah. you know, our personal experience is, is most of our life. And there was a very moving piece in The New York Times, mm -hmm. and it was written by um, a physician who worked in the ER about 
trusting patients. And she, she writes about having a drug addict lie to her and she had trusted them and she shouldn't have maybe. And like, this is the stuff that life is made of. These are the ethical decisions that aren't necessarily captured in traditional reporting all the time. And, you know, especially now where the media really is suffering a crisis of, you know, either it's very well funded and has an agenda or, you know, ad revenue has dried up and it's, it's hard to um, just make money off of journalism in the same way. So a lot of the stories are reported very quickly and you call, you know, the same sources. And that's not to say there aren't amazing journalists reporting, especially in Jewish media, but I think sometimes we lose the, the intimacy that readers um, really benefit from. So mm-hmm. I, I think that when writing an op-ed, um, sometimes people think that they have to make this like super analytical argument with you know five contentions and sometimes a piece that just says, this is my experience, this is what I learned from it, and I hope that that helps you see the world in a different light. Um, my, my opinion fellow, Nora Berman, wrote a really beautiful piece recently um, about why she, as a leftist, supports funding the Iron Dome. And she opened with her personal experience of being in Israel and what it's like to have rockets. Um, and I think it's very hard to negate personal experience. Um, Mm -hmm. Of course, again, she also used data. She also linked to other sources. But I think that opinion journalism does something very powerful in that it lets humans be humans in a way that doesn't always come through in reporting. It's really interesting that the power behind it, but also the honesty behind it, especially in a time where dishonest reporting is kind of taking center stage. And even the idea of what is honest is very much politicized. There's something very valuable about a piece that promises a point of view instead of hides the point of view. Right. Is that, is that something that you're conscious of when you're, when you're reading through these pieces? Yeah, definitely. Um, look, I take fact checking very seriously yeah. and we want to make sure that every assertion of fact that a writer makes in our pages is accurate. Um, but it's, it's so hard to tell even if you're an educated person, whether or not information is reliable these days, yeah. like you said. Um, and there's so many third parties. I, I don't think we fully comprehend just how deep it goes. Um, you know, yeah. most of us nowadays, we encounter most articles we read on social media. And even if it's from a reliable source, you know, how did it get in our feed? Why is it so prominent in our feed? Yeah. Like, these are deep questions. Um, And I I don't think that opinion journalism can ever replace really good quality reported journalism. I think ideally it complements it. I see my job as adding nuance and different perspective to the stories that are being reported out. Like right now, um, the Supreme Court is considering a whole new slate of cases. So my thinking is, you know, who can I get to write pieces on this that have personal experience with all of these topics, whether it's abortion or religious liberty? Mm-hmm. How can I make people not just skim a headline and see, OK, a 6-3 decision, but really think about the people who are affected by yeah. changes in our society? I think that's really my underlying goal. If, if I can accomplish one thing as a journalist, it's, it's to get everyone to understand that policy is never just about policy. Communal decisions are not just about the people that make the decisions. They affect all mm-hmm. of us in a variety of ways. And, and that's the power of, of opinion writing. As an opinion editor, how do you balance your own point of view with the point of views of people who submit to you? What if someone submits a story that's something that you might disagree with? How do you kind of balance those two ways of thinking? So I, it's funny, I actually find that it's easiest for me to edit the pieces that I very strongly disagree with because yeah. <laughs> I'm a tougher editor. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, ideally you want someone, whether you're writing a formal op-ed or, or just asking for feedback, 
from a friend, like you want someone that can really challenge your ideas in general. I think it helps all of yeah. us grow. And sometimes if I agree with a piece, I'm kind of just nodding along instead of, you know, if I'm editing a piece I really disagree with, I'm going to really fact check each line, probably yeah. more in depth, honestly, than I would a piece I already agree with. And, you know, I think that results in pieces that are much stronger, ultimately. There's also an advantage to, you know, unlike some traditional news sites, a lot of our opinion pieces can't necessarily be divided on the left-right continuum. They're more yeah. um, cultural experiences or, you know, why a particular individual or piece of art or pop culture had deep impact. Um, so they're, they're not always, you know, I'm personally very bored by these pieces that as soon as you see the headline, you know what they're going to say. Like, yeah. whether I agree with it or not, I don't want to read another piece telling me, you know, abortion should be legal for everyone, abortion should be illegal for everyone, unless, yeah. again, there's some new, fresh insight, and that's, that's the personal experience. Yeah. And as an editor, how do you make sure that every story gets to be told, that people with different religious backgrounds or racial backgrounds or ethnic backgrounds or gender backgrounds have an opportunity to have a platform equally? It's very challenging. Um, the format of the op-ed, it's not as old as people think. The yeah. New York Times in the 70s decided that they should put op-ed literally stands for opposite the editorial. So the New York yeah. Times would have in their voice yeah. the editorial, you know, from on high perspective. And they yeah. would publish one usually male, usually Ivy League, usually white, writer in their 50s <laughs> yeah. next to it to show that they could, you know, be open to diverse perspectives. And that sort of thinking is really hard to break. And the field of opinion writing is still very male dominated. Mm -hmm. Think tank world is very male dominated. Yeah. And not to quote Donald Rumsfeld, but I'll paraphrase. Um, there's the things we know we don't know. And there's the things we don't know we don't know. So... Yeah. It's very challenging, especially right now during COVID, when most of us have been working from home for such a long time. I really push myself to try to encounter people that I don't normally encounter in my everyday life. So a big part of it for me starts with just literally tracking diversity. I know it sounds very cold, but I, I have a spreadsheet, you know, of every piece I publish was the author male or female. Mm -hmm. Are they a Jew or a person of color? Are they LGBTQ or writing about those issues? And racial and LGBTQ diversity, we have about in line at the forward with, with what it is in the Jewish community. Um, but I will tell you right now, only 35% of the op-eds I've published um, since I joined the forward in May have been by women. And it's mm -hmm. just, it, part of it is the nature of who is submitting pieces. And part of it is that, you know, we really have to be relentless in our pursuit of different voices. And yeah. it's challenging. I won't pretend it's not. But yeah. I, I think a big tool that journalists have right now, in some ways, is social media. Um, mm -hmm. You know, going into different Facebook communities or Twitter communities. Um, often if I find a really interesting person outside of my normal circle, I'll go and see everyone they follow on Twitter and see, yeah. you know, who else I can connect with. But it's challenging. I mean, in quote unquote normal times, um, I think going to events or different social programming is, is a good way to connect with diverse voices. But um, I think also we need to do a better job in media of signaling to people that do come from diverse backgrounds that we want to hear from them. Yeah. For example, the forward had a perception that I don't think is accurate, but it had a perception for a while as, as being a little bit more to the left. And we've done a lot of deliberate outreach, reaching out to more center or center right voices and encouraging them to write for us. Mm -hmm. I think successfully we've done that. Um, also, you know, the American Jewish community and to some extent, the global Jewish community is, is very Ashkenazi dominated. Mm -hmm. And going outside of that is very important. And yeah. I think you just have to be better at signaling your willingness to work with people or 
reminding them that their stories are important. When I teach mm -hmm. op-ed writing workshops, I do a lot of workshops for Jewish women's organizations in particular, and often these women with amazing life experiences don't realize that they have these amazing life experiences that would make mm -hmm. a perfect opinion piece. And so I think a big part of my personal mission is just reminding people that they have a voice and they can use that voice to affect change on the issues they care about. I think what you're pointing to is an issue that even exists outside of the journalism world. I think whenever it comes to just this idea of women voicing opinions, um, I'm a college student and I've spoken about this a bit on this podcast before. Um, I'm studying political science and Jewish studies. And oftentimes in the political science field, it's almost a joke amongst the female students that we speak maybe a quarter as often as the men mm. do. But the things that we say are always very, very well thought through, whereas the men kind of say every thought that comes into their minds during mm. class, um, which I think that there's value in both perspectives. But the idea that women have to be so sure of everything that we say or else it will come under such harsh criticism, I mm. think is really interesting considering what you're explaining about op-eds as a field that women tend to be a little bit more hesitant to share our points of view because we're afraid of that. We're conscious of the fact that women do often come under harsher criticism than men do for having similar opinions. Mm -hmm. um, and you talk about this gender dynamic in the field, but you are a female editor in the same field. How has that experience been for you? Have you felt pushed back because of it? It's a very interesting question, Julia. I think yeah. that our generation has gotten a lot better at speaking up. I think yeah. millennial and Gen Z women yeah. feel empowered to speak. Yeah. I think unfortunately what hasn't changed is the extent to which women are judged based on things that yes. have nothing to do <laughs> with their opinion. I think one of the most clearest examples of this is, you know, in, in the Theranos trials, um, mm -hmm. the fact that Elizabeth Holmes felt the need to modulate her voice so low. That's a thing that has been around forever. It's, you know, it's called vocal yeah. fry. And so many women train themselves to present as more masculine. And if they uh -huh. don't, they're judged. And if they do, they're judged. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I had a very painful experience um, that probably wasn't painful to anyone else involved, but I, I had written a story and I was out to lunch with my male colleague, you know, 15 minutes after pressing publish, which is never a good idea. <laughs> but, um, you know, we were at lunch and his phone rings and it's the PR person for um, a very major Jewish organization um, with complaints about my story. And this is, again, this is a colleague. Wow. This was actually someone in you know, a, a lower down on the masthead position than me. Um, wow. And I, I actually did say something, you know, I, I told the PR person, you. you know, this is very inappropriate that you called my male colleague to complain about my story. And, you know, he yeah. hemmed and hawed, oh, I can reach you. Not true. Um, yeah. But I, I think that's the, that's the sort of yeah. nerishkeit to use a Jewish word, that, that women <laughs> often encounter. And, you know, the amount of thought that every woman has to put into every outfit when she gives a public appearance is just yeah. so huge. And I think in pitching article ideas, the way that I see it play out a lot is, I think a big one is because of this, you know, extra work that women have to do. I find that if I'm writing a piece of my own and I want to reach out to different experts, if I want the piece to include, you know, half female and half male experts, I have to reach out to twice as many women as men because I think it's just the reality. Women have so many more demands on their time mm -hmm. um, as as equal a society as we are in so many ways now. It's just the fact of the matter is women statistically on average have much more domestic responsibility and those of us who don't are still pulled in so many directions so when it comes to selling our ideas I think we've gotten better um, one thing I really encourage the women that that I mentor or work with to do is to mm -hmm. go through your email and take out 
I think, I believe, I feel in your yes. in your sentences because I have to do that all the time. I'm the worst <laughs> culprit of it. If we're writing an opinion piece, of course we we think or we yeah. believe or we feel. And I to me it shows that we've been taught to soften our opinions or to couch them in language that is more, you know, stereotypically feminine. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, I am a big proponent that the West needs much more feminine energy. But yeah. the fact that women have to be so careful all the time is a big psychic drain mm -hmm. in, in ways that I don't think the average, certainly not the average, um, you know, middle-class white American man experiences. And again, mm -hmm. there's always cases where this is not true, but, um, you know, women and people of color and, and those from minority communities just have to expend a lot more psychic energy generally in the world. Yeah. And again, I'm saying this from a very privileged position. Like I'm an Upper East Side, um, you know, very comfortable person right now. But, you know, I, I think we all need to be cognizant of where we stand. And yeah. for women in particular, we, we should be cognizant of the fact that we have these extra demands made of us, not in a way that's disempowering, but to be a little bit gentler on ourselves and remind mm. ourselves that, you know, we do have an important perspective and yeah. yes, we have to be more careful as we present it, but out of that can come, like you said, like strength. Absolutely. And that really brings us pretty perfectly to our last question um, and how we like to close out every interview here at Nice Jewish Girls. So our audience is kind of the demographic that you're talking about. Um, everyone listens to our podcast, but the majority of people are, are, are young women. Um, mm -hmm. And the hope is that through this conversation that we have today, they can walk away as if they'd spoken to you with a mentor, with a friend that can give them some guidance. Mm -hmm. um, and you talked about mentoring other young girls as well. What is one piece of advice that you'd want to give to anyone listening to this, specifically young Jewish women, about how to navigate the world as a, as a Jewish woman, about how to embody that strength and lack of apology that's so important as you move forward to a new generation. It's okay to change and it's okay to do something that you're afraid might have consequences. Mm -hmm. We very often get stuck in routine or doing what we think we're supposed to be doing. And I, I read a quote from a psychiatrist about how, you know, when we're 18, we think everyone is watching us. When we're 40, we don't care that everyone's watching us. And when we're 80, we realize no one's been watching us. And <laughs> I, I don't think it's 100% accurate, but I, I do think that you know, the only person that we have to spend all of our lives with is ourselves. And we often are afraid to try things out of our comfort zone or that are outside of what we feel like our community expects us to do or our family expects us to do or our younger self expected us to do. And it's just so important that we allow ourselves the opportunity to make mistakes and to evolve and to experience newness in this world um, while we can. And, you know, I'm, I'm 27, but the older I get, the more I realize that the more of life you spend looking over the shoulder, the less you are able to actually live. And mm -hmm. it's just so important to not get caught up in those expectations and to, you know, let yourself experience joy and experience newness in this world. Yeah. I think this is all incredible. And I know it's all stuff that I need to hear personally. So I'm sure that everyone listening can agree as well. Thank you so much for joining us today, Laura. It's been incredible to hear from you. Thank you for sharing your experiences um, and to all of the women listening, submit some op-eds because we need more female voices represented. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you, Julia. <laughs> it's been so fun. Of course. Thank you so much. So this was an incredible conversation we got to have today with Laura. But there's one piece that I just cannot get out of my mind. While we've been making strides toward equality in the Jewish community, it's clear we still have a lot of work to do. 
But what disturbs me the most is the demographic that Laura says is most poorly represented in terms of op-ed submissions. Women. And well, it makes a disgusting amount of sense. Women's voices are always questioned. Women's narratives are always second-guessed. I've experienced it myself. Ask any woman with a platform. We are subjected to scrutiny far beyond our male counterparts. So what do we do with that? Do we just be quiet? I'd sure hope not. The reason why the female voice is always questioned is because of the very power it holds. And until it can be represented equally, there is much work to be done. And this, my friends, is where we'll leave you for today's episode of Nice Jewish Girls. Hopefully a bit smarter and a bit more inspired. Your feedback is critical to making this show the best that it can be. So contact us at podcasts at jewishimpact.com. Next week, in honor of Holocaust Remembrance Day, we will be joined by a very special guest, Tova Friedman. Tova is a survivor from Auschwitz-Birkenau who has become a public speaker and advocate. Tova will be honoring us all by sharing her story with nice Jewish girls. This is an especially meaningful interview for me, and I'd imagine it will be for you all too. Don't miss it.